Good evening and welcome to WPSU's Vote 08 election special. I'm Patty Satalia. Over the next three weeks, we'll talk with the candidates running for the three state row offices. That's Attorney General, Auditor General, and State Treasurer. We begin tonight with the race for State Treasurer. The office is up for grabs because incumbent Treasurer Robin Weissman agreed not to seek re-election when Governor Ed Rendell appointed her to finish Senator Bob Casey's term. Three candidates are vying for the job, Republican Tom Ellis, Democrat Rob McCord, and Libertarian Burley Edsel. We'll be hearing from all three candidates, beginning with Rob McCord. Despite the fact that of the three row offices, the state treasurer is probably the least well-known, flying largely under the public's radar, you say, quote, the treasurer's office really matters. Why are you running for this position? Well, I, I'm running in part because I know it really matters. You invest more than $100 billion a year. And when you talk with real voters about what they're nervous about, what they care about in these traumatic economic times, up come issues that the state treasurer very directly addresses, whether it has to do with college loans or the mortgage crisis or job security or economic security or retirement security. Those are right down the strike zone uh, of a professional state treasurer. And I'm running because I come out of business. I'm an independent person. I'm not a career politician. I've had more than 15 years experience investing pension dollars. I've invested more than a hundred, uh, more than a billion dollars, uh, hundreds of millions of it from pension funds. So I know what I'm doing and particularly in these challenging times, I think I can best serve Pennsylvanians. You just talked a little bit about your investment background. As you know, in the primaries, your uh, opponents, uh, challenged you on your investment record. Uh, John Cordisco uh, talked about uh, the fact that uh, some of your investments of state employee retirement funds didn't do so well. One fund over a 10-year period uh, did less than 1%. Uh, another apparently lost 26%. I think he's, uh, some of his data is wrong. First of all, John's now heavily supporting me, so whatever he found, he's ended up uh, heavily supporting me once I was the Democratic nominee. As a, somebody who's not a career politician, I'm getting used to this sort of throwing mud balls and going, wait, that's inaccurate, that's inaccurate. And people People say, oh, that's just part of this contest. The fact is, I have a very strong investment track record. And in my business, you don't get hired and rehired. You can get fired every year. So to stay at it for 15 years with all kinds of gatekeepers and staff and others, it, you know, checking your record, it's, it, I have an overwhelmingly good one. I've, you know, made hundreds of millions of dollars in profit, generated thousands of jobs. Now, in the economic downturn of 2000, 2001, in the tech crisis, while we continue to run better than NASDAQ, Deck, we had a downturn in one of my five uh, investment uh, enterprises. I was in a public company and four, four private uh, venture funds. And we basically batted four out of five. And even in the fifth, the jury's not in and we're running ahead of the, the NASDAQ benchmark. So everybody who actually peels into the data says, wait, McCord went to Harvard on a scholarship, went to Wharton and got his MBA, spent 15 years in finance, worked for a decade on Capitol Hill, were on budget and regulatory issues is a leader in the tech sector and understands how to use technology to increase transparency. This guy is qualified for this job. And as they start to care about the job, and they're just beginning to start to care about Treasury, given what's going on at Federal Treasury and so forth, they're starting to say, this, this guy seems to be the best qualified. And I'm proud of that. And I think a lot of people are going to vote for McCord. Your campaign has raised between 5 and $6 million. Mm -hmm. uh, 1.4 million of that funded as a loan out mm -hmm. of your own pocket. Correct. Um, we're talking about a job that 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 uh, pays roughly $141,000 right, a right, year. So right, lots of people yeah, uh, are scratching their heads. You've right. retired from right. your investment business. That's right. Why? Well, it's a, a lousy return on investment if all you care about is money. Uh, the fact is, I, I my personal background has a lot to do with why I'm running. I was raised primarily by a single mom, a career school teacher, the largest single pension fund you run is a school teacher's pension fund that we should all care about, both because we care about education and because we're all on the hook for the liabilities. But my mom, when I was four, went through a really bad divorce, wasn't remarried until I was 14, went through a decade of economic trauma. I'm certain I can serve people who are playing hard and, and working by the rules, and working hard and, and playing by the rules, and, and are still suffering from economic insecurity. So that's the, the core job. But also, after I got that financial aid to go to Harvard, I then went to work on Capitol Hill. 
and I thought, you know what, I want to be financially independent. I'm going to go to the Wharton School, arguably one of the best schools of finance in the country. My mom sat me down and said, I'm worried you're going to make your life too much about money. She literally thought the life of the mind and the life of service was what was worth doing. And I assured her, and I'm making sure I'm, my pledge is accurate, that I would not do that, that I wanted to become financially independent. I had a vision about how to do that, and that I would then go back into public service. And as I worked in finance, I realized the treasurer's office was where I could do by far the most good. So I'm, I'm honoring a pledge to my mom as I do this. Well, speaking of a pledge, uh, many say that lots of your contributors are investment bankers. And as someone who will sit on the boards of SERS and PSERS, uh, investing state monies, um, that those people who contributed in your campaign will expect some business in return. So your pledge, early on anyway, was to recuse yourself in those situations. It, you're exactly Exactly right. Yeah. Some say, though, if you recuse yourself, maybe you're not the right person, if it's necessary for you to do that. Oh, no. Well, a couple of things just to clarify. You, you have the vast bulk of my heavy contributors are just old friends with whom I made money in a very successful business career. So you have a friend who made $300 million. He gives you $25,000. He does. He's just saying, we worked together and got some good work done. And that happened again and again and again. And second, I have put in an order of magnitude more money than anybody else has. I frankly can afford to annoy any or all of my contributors and I can afford to run a very well-funded re-election race. So I have true independence. Uh, third, people can check for transparency uh, as we go along. We'll be posting memos, et cetera. Just to give you a sense of scale, there might be 20 uh, asset managers, not investment bankers, they're actually asset managers, investors, um, but uh, there might be 20 out of 20,000 or 30,000 people who become before what are called peasers and servers. Uh, so to recuse and also to have staff and gatekeepers and to be able to come forward and say, I know these people, but you have to look at me as a friend of theirs. I can tell you what I know, and I think that informs the process. But I think all elected officials have bias, and I'll just end with this. I'm running against a machine politician. There you don't have transparency. The Republican uh, machine of Montgomery County has accepted millions upon millions of dollars from asset managers, but you can't connect the dots between that machine and the sitting state treasurer. I, as an independent person, and we'll post all of my contributors. Everything will be absolutely trackable, trackable, and I want people to audit me just as I'll be auditing others for true independence. If elected, what will be your number one or, or two uh, top priorities? E economic security, in particular for seniors. Um, you know, seniors so heavily depend on secure retirement, uh, and tightly related to that are these pension funds. I have the expertise and the background as an investment professional. I expect people to say McCord knows what he's doing with these pension funds and can help us out of these traumatic times, can help increase economic security and increase total community return on investment as we see these bad asset managers out of New York and Europe and elsewhere doing a bad job, having more domestic Pennsylvania managers and more jobs and green collar jobs created here helping seniors. We can do that. Some say one of the things we need to do in Pennsylvania is consolidate. We have more municipal pension funds than any other state. 25 percent of the municipal funds are here in the state because there are so many many uh, funds that are uh, w with maybe 10 people in them, the overhead, the administrative costs of those are astronomical. Yeah. What would you do about that? Yeah, Patty, you're absolutely right. There's, uh, you need consolidation, and you've had balkanization, partially due to the fact that this was a colonial state. So we have all these borders, uh, political borders. Uh, that's one point. On the other we, hand, we need to protect a lot of the more rural, more smaller retirement funds from being um, taxed in a sort of stealth way to subsidize the underfunded pension funds of what are essentially shrinking cities, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Scranton. So we have to be very careful in the way that we do these. I would prefer to do it on an opt-in basis and to see seal the past liabilities away from the new process, consolidate going forward so that you don't dig the, dig the hole deeper and use true investment professionals to get the highest possible return going forward and to consolidate that way. And in doing so, we can protect the seniors not only of today but of the future. With just a couple seconds, why you and not Tom? Ellis. Uh, if you want another bond lawyer in uh, Harrisburg and if you want a, re a Republican, then you would vote for Tom Ellis. If you want somebody who's a Democratic teammate working on health care reform, but even more importantly, somebody who doesn't come from a machine, a business leader with the right specific experience to be treasurer, vote for McCord. Very nice talking with you. Same here.
the job of state treasurer is an important one, and especially in these uncertain economic times, although it is a, a row office that largely flies under the public's radar. Why do you think this is an important position, and why are you interested in the job? Well, certainly it's important. Under the state treasurer directly is $18.5 billion of state tax dollars. And then you're also involved with all the pension funds in the state, which is over $100 billion. And if that money's not there, more money has to come in to the general fund, more taxes have to go up, and that's not something we want at all. So it's a very important position to watch over the money of the Commonwealth. Unfortunately, it's a position that doesn't get a lot of attention. Um, most people don't care about it. You ask about it, they say, we didn't even know we had a state treasurer, or the governor gets to appoint the treasurer. But that's not true. You, you run for it. Um, I enjoy running for it because uh, it's... I've been a bond lawyer for 23 years. Um, I was a county commissioner in Montgomery County for four, a township commissioner for 12. And together, this just is the perfect job uh, for me, watching the state's money and, and running a state agency as it should be run in a business-like fashion. Uh, explain that in a business-like fashion, <clears throat> because you and your uh, Democratic uh, opponent, uh, Rob McCord, say that it should be run like a business and, and that it takes a businessman and not a politician. How do you distinguish yourself from what he's saying? Right, well, because I've had the 23 years' experience as a, as a bond lawyer, as a municipal finance lawyer, but also running a government like Montgomery County, the third largest county in the state. We had a half-billion-dollar budget. Um, um, 500 million in the pension fund as well and I was able to run it and cut taxes not only one time but twice something that's not been done in, in a county in Pennsylvania and I don't know when and we did it because I ran it like a business so I have the experience running a, a large company basically we cut down travel costs that was just a simple thing we had people going five or six people going to out of state um, I said that's ridiculous. For conferences, for conferences, and such. seminars in Florida, California, Las Vegas, that's not what people want to see their tax dollars go for. So either we didn't send anybody, or we would send one person and let them bring it back and have a seminar in house. That's what I wanted to do. We did it there, and we saved with that two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. I was also able to refinance all the debt at the county, um, saved thirty million dollars there. Um, and by doing that, was able to cut taxes about 8% overall in, in a, a two-year period while still building all sorts of new um, public uh, safety projects because people hate paying taxes. Everybody hates paying taxes. But if they're going to pay taxes, they want to do it to protect their families, to protect their children, and know every dollar is accounted for. Accountability is big. People in Pennsylvania are, are getting weary of scandals, everything from, from FIA to uh, uh, middle-of-the-night pay raises. I'm wondering what you would do if elected <clears throat> to uh, uh, create transparency in the office of state treasurer. Well, absolutely, and it saddens me to see the, the confidence level so low in both our state government and federal government. One of the things that I did as a county commissioner and I proposed at the state level for the state treasurer's office is campaign finance reform. Uh, the day I go in in January, we will say no contributions to the state treasurer or any state treasurer candidate above a de minimis amount, $250, if you want to do business with the state treasurer's office. And that's not something new. That's already done with underwriters. Um, and I'm familiar with that with bond underwriters. But we have to do it with the private equity funds as well, because they're the ones who are willing to give large contributions in order to be able to invest money, uh, the state's money. The state's money should be invested for the right reasons, and the right reasons being that that's the best investment vehicle. So we do have to increase that um, confidence level into, into um, our electorate, and it, it's up to the um, officials to do that. Uh, the current state treasurer is Robin Weissman. She was appointed to replace Democrat Bob Casey, uh, who stepped down when he was elected to the U.S. Uh, Senate. Um, Weissman is the wife of one of your partners, and she is not in the running. Um, what, if any, of her initiatives would you continue, and what would be your own priorities should you be elected? Well, Rob and I are longtime friends, and Rob and I actually work together professionally um, <clears throat> when she was an, an underwriter and we developed a uh, pension bond program for municipalities throughout the state and saved a number of uh, third-class cities like Reading and, and others. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the things that she has, has um, started to advertise is our College 529 program. And 
we have one. It should be the best. It's not. It's getting better. Uh, I applaud Robin for advertising it, but I want to take it the next step. And I would like to provide incentives, financial incentives. If you start saving and use our 529 plan at the state, we'll give you a tuition discount at our state schools and our state assisted schools like Penn State, um, Temple, Pitt. And we can do that by leveraging money and it won't even cost the taxpayers anything. I'd like to deliver packages at the hospitals for the, for the newborns. Here's a way to start saving for college because you're not going to be able to count on FIA. We've seen that. You're not going to be able to count on the federal government. You've got to be self-reliant. And the more we can get people to save earlier, um, the better it is for our entire state because the more kids that can go to college, uh, the better it is for our economy. So I'm really committed to that. I have two kids in, in, in college. I know how hard it is to save. It should be a little hard to go, but it shouldn't be impossible. We have to make it a lot easier. You mentioned finances a little bit ago. Uh, your opponent, Rob McCord, has raised, he raised more than $4 million during the primary. You ran in the primary unopposed. Tell us a little bit about where you are, um, what your support base is, and how confident you are in, in being able to launch a successful campaign here. Well, we're very confident. Um, we have tried to stay away from the large contributions from people that want to do business uh, with, with the office. I don't think that's what people want to see today. I think that's what causes politicians to, to be looked at askew. Um, we have a very large base going from Pittsburgh to Erie to Philadelphia to Montour to Center County of contributors and things from $5 to $10,000. Um, but you know, when we announced a policy, we have to adhere to that policy. So we're, tr we're trying to do that and let people know that we're not going to be providing business because you give me a, a campaign contribution. We're, we're into retail politics. I, we had tried to get my opponent to debate. Um, we asked him for town meetings. He's refused. Um, so I think he's going to the big media. We're, we're just going around doing coffees. We're doing retail politics, going to all the county fairs, eating food on a stick. Um, every kind of food on a stick you can imagine. In fact, <laughs> the, the office, as I said, a lot of people don't pay attention to it. I told a joke at the Republican convention that I told them I cut taxes, I put in panic buttons into schools, I did all these things. But I said, one of the, th one of the things you have to do when you're running, you, you go, you eat food on a stick at, at uh, fairs, and in Bucks County they had turkey on a stick, and I said, not just a little piece of turkey, a 10 pound turkey on a stick, they call it the Ed Rendell special. That <laughs> the Ed Randell special joke, that went from one end of the state to the other, not anything I did as, as a county commissioner or what I would do as state treasurer. So it's a, it's a fun job to run for. It's an interesting job to run for, and you have to have humility when you're running for it. Tell us a little bit about your political aspirations, because these row offices are often stepping stones to governorships or, as Bob Casey did, uh, the U.S. Senate. Well, and I think that's a problem when they, people see uh, people in these offices that have no background in finance and really just want to move ahead to the next level. I've already said, this is it. I'd like to do eight years, uh, because if you say you only want to do one term, you're lame duck right away. But I'd like to do eight years in the treasurer's office and go back to, to private business, private industry. I was a township commissioner, county commissioner. I'm not a professional politician. And I, I've always liked Thomas Jefferson, that model. And I think that's what we need in this country. Okay, in a word, why, why should voters vote uh, for Tom Ellis and, and not your opponents? Because I have the experience and I'll save the taxpayer the money and I've shown I can do that. I've done it before and I'll do it again. All right, thanks so much for talking with us. Thanks for having me. Why are you interested in becoming the state treasurer? I'd like to help uh, overall the uh, Libertarian Party to help us uh, get some freedom in the United States, particularly in Pennsylvania, to help establish a Libertarian Party as, a, uh, as an established minor party, as the minor party at the present time, and uh, to uh, give people a chance to find out what's going on in Pennsylvania. I think a state treasurer could open the books and various things like that so that people would know, let the press know what's going on, and a variety of things. And to help our major candidates, Bob Barr is now on the ballot as of a few days ago. I'd like to campaign and make help be sure that he gets on a considerable vote. Now, you have been a libertarian for the past 30 years, and while it's yes, the third 
uh, largest political party in the United States. It's not well understood by lots of Americans. Um, explain what the basic principles of libertarianism uh, are. The basic principles of the Libertarian Party um, have to do with what the other the Rep Republican Party steals are words in their rhetoric. So if I said it, it sounds like it's Republican, it's not. We believe in lower taxes and less government, for real, not just rhetoric. Okay, that's the biggest difference. Um, we don't believe in force. We, d we don't want to have force for social change and that sort of thing. All the regulations and things like this, everybody says there ought to be a law. We say no, there shouldn't be a law. Okay, let individuals have some freedom to establish their own lives on all sorts of things. So that's the basic principles. And uh, we're, we're, the United States is already down the socialistic path so far, it'll be a long time to bring it back to where we had freedom back 150 years ago or so. Now, the race for state treasurer fights for attention during an election year with, a, with a, a hotly contested presidential race. And unfortunately, many voters don't really know what a state treasurer is or what they do. Um, they don't even know that we have one in, 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 in some areas. So what do you want voters to know about how important this particular position is? Um, some of the things that we could do is to let people know of the amount of money that goes to the various uh, places, to the legislators. I might bring up bonus gate, for example. Um, I'd like to assist the Attorney General in retrieving some of the monies that are stolen or, let's say, taken um, from the taxpayers, okay? All kinds of friends and relatives are being paid in bonus gate. You can talk about other issues such as um, the legislative package a year or so ago. Um, not only the legislators that gave themselves a raise at 2 o'clock in the morning, which is probably illegal. It was illegal in that there were no hearings taken. They subsequently, through public pressure, changed the legislation and took it back. What I would do if I saw a law that was being passed probably illegally, I would hold the funds of that in escrow and not distribute that excess money until it was checked out by the legal process. With the cooperation, if we have a libertarian attorney general, then we would have cooperation to get investigations done. And if I get Why a would you have cooperation? Because it'd be less bipartisan? Absolutely. Everything in Pennsylvania is, is nepotism and coordination, and uh, we have the most corrupt government in, in the United States, probably. I mean, it's a tie between a couple of them, okay? Most corrupt nepotism, so one person this. So they just, the Republican Democratic Party just get on the phone and say, what about this, what about that? So I could expose this, and the main thing is just freedom of the press. I know we have less freedom of the press and so on since the Patriot Act, but I still would like to cooperate in dealing with that so that people would know. And we could retrieve some of that money now, the treasurer invests the state's retirement uh, nest eggs. We're talking about more yeah. than a billion dollars of yes. uh, state workers and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, public school uh, employee retirement yeah. funds. And, of course, this requires demands, experience, and sound decision-making. And I'm wondering what you bring to the table that would compensate uh, for the lack of day-to-day -day portfolio management experience. I bring uh, something called character and truth and honesty. My, uh, um, something that the other two parties do not bring to it. There are things happen. I happen to be personally knowledgeable of a situation back in 1972 where I was on a statewide negotiating team where I, our, our team observed and tracked down to find out what the Pennsylvania, the SCRS and the PSERS particularly were being managed at that time by Mellon Bank for 2% interest at the time of double digit inflation. We, through our efforts, pointed that out to the governor, and the governor was understanding of that, and they appointed new directors and so on of those two pension funds. And uh, now they're being managed properly and getting the reasonable return. Before that, Mellon Bank was just stealing all that money. Um, things of this nature the treasurer needs to know about, and, be a, and they're actually a member of those committees, but not the main one, but a member of it. 
so we could uh, deal with, uh, with that fund. I'm, I'm familiar with both of those funds. There are other ones too, the state police fund, pension fund. Uh, as I s have read on, on your resume, you are uh, a former auditor for Ashland Township in Clarion yes. County. You're the elected constable. Mm -hmm. You have years' experience as a public school teacher and as a university uh, instructor or professor of, of math and finance mm -hmm. and those sorts of things. What on your personal or professional resume do you think best prepares you for the job of state treasurer? Well, it's a lifetime of being honest and open to everything. I have helped create some of those courses. Um, and uh, even though it is in a, from a scholastic standpoint, um, I believe I have a wide range of information. I've never taught or gotten involved in any organization that I didn't do a good job, according to those who evaluate me, okay? And uh, uh, even goes way back when I was a board ship, you know, as a new person. Um, You're talking about your days in the, in the Navy during the Korean War. It was War. significant training because we had about 32 different duties at one time and we had to coordinate that. Small ship, I understand that. At one point, I was the executive officer because the executive officer was ill. The captain, I moved up from operations to executive officer, I actually was the administrative officer of that ship Okay, at that time. Um, the, the many jobs that I had at Cheney University, the place that I taught the longest period was 18 years at Cheney University. That's near Philadelphia, as you call. Um, it gave me some experience, and I, I read widely on that. And my life as um, uh, all of my experiences are such. I have been politically active and read extensively and keep track of what is going on. And uh, I know that I can do a good job and I would not allow any nepotism, and I would even evaluate the people who work in the treasurer's office, and if they got their job by some sort of an inside deal, I would deal with that. If elected, what would your top priority be? My top priority would be make it open to the public. I would be open to the public, and I would let people know of something that is questionable, let the press in on it, open the books and say, you figure it out. If you want to have an auditor come and check, there the books are. Nothing hidden. Uh, some of the administrators of the various things, such as FIA, um, that's a student loan organization, which is under scrutiny now, finally. What about all the legislators that took advantage of that and have a condo in Florida? We might even, if we retrieve some of that, we might own some condos in Florida. And on that note, we're, we're out of time. Uh, Burley Etzel, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Well, thank you. I enjoyed talking. The election is now just 25 days away. You can learn more about the candidates by visiting the Vote 08 section on our website at wpsu.org front slash vote 08, keeping you informed. And be sure to join us next week when we'll talk with the candidates running for Pennsylvania Attorney General. That's the state's top cop. For all of us here at Penn State Public Broadcasting, I'm Patty Satalia. Thanks for joining us and have a good night. Presentation of Vote 08 on WPSU is made possible in part by a grant from Caparilla Furniture, serving central Pennsylvania for over 50 years with showrooms in Belfont, Altoona, and Lewistown. Featuring Thomasville Furniture. Information at caparillafurniture.com. Additional support comes from the members of WPSU. You're watching WPSU-TV Clearfield. Presentation of Foreign Exchange on WPSU is made possible in part by a grant from Hogue's Catering at Celebration Hall in State College, helping you plan your business and professional meetings with facilities to handle groups of every size. Hogue's Catering and Celebration Hall, State College. 
Additional support comes from Comfort Suites of State College, providing accommodations and meeting facilities, including complimentary breakfast near the Penn State campus, and from the members of WPSU. Hello and welcome to Foreign Exchange. I'm Daljit Daliwal. This week has China been changed by the Olympic spirit. Then a new film about life in Iran and a discussion with the Iranian-American who has written a book about it. All this and more coming right up on Foreign Exchange where America meets the world. <laughs> This program is made possible through the generous support of the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, making grants to promote international understanding and address the root causes of global poverty. And now, Daljit Daliwal. From the Olympics to a recent spacewalk, China's meteoric rise on the world stage has been extraordinary. Yet, as a high-stakes player in the global economy, it's also facing a slate of difficult challenges. There's the growing financial crisis, problems over product safety, and a $6 billion arms deal between the United States and Taiwan. To shed some light on what China will do about these challenges, we're joined by Min Xing Pei of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Welcome to the program. Thank you. I wanted to start off by asking you about the U.S. financial crisis. What effect has that had on China's economy and on ordinary Chinese? So far, the effect is minimal, and I would say mostly psychological. Uh, China's capital s markets are closed to the outside, so money cannot get into China or money cannot get out of China very easily. And that means that Chinese banks hold practically no subprime debt from U.S banks and that saves them. But looking forward, the Chinese government is very worried because the U.S. market and the European markets are China's biggest export markets. They account for about two-thirds of Chinese exports. So a year from now, when these economies slow down, China's export growth will slow down and that will put a lot of pressure on China. Right. And how has China been able to cushion itself from this U U.S. financial uh, economic mess. I mean, given that it is a global player and that it does hold a lot of U.S. debt. Well, so far, this firewall, so-called capital control, has prevented the Chinese financial system from being infected by this global contagion. But at the same time, China is a very fast-growing economy, which means it has a lot of internal demand. So even if export growth slows down, China can stimulate its domestic demand because China is engaged in a massive urbanization program. And that means a lot of roads, a lot of houses, a lot of schools have to be built. And that will provide some cushion. But over the long run, Chinese economy will have to slow down because of the global economic crisis. And the vast amount of U.S. debt that China holds, I mean, is it likely to use that as some kind of political weapon against the United States? No, it will be financial suicide for China because the first thing that will happen is that the value of such debt will plummet and China will take a huge financial loss. So China and the U.S. are tied together in this financial mess. I'd also like to get your insights on the uh, presidential election. We're just a few weeks away from knowing who's going to be walking into the White House. What, how is this story playing out in China with the, with the government and with ordinary Chinese? I mean, is there a preference in terms of whether it's Obama or McCain that they would like to see um, in the White House? As far as I can tell, that is by reading the Chinese official press, they appear to be indifferent. Uh, the officials refrain from commenting on this because China's official policy is not to interfere in other countries' domestic affairs. However, if they have to pick, I would say that slightly they would prefer Obama because Obama is a less of a hardliner on foreign policy. McCain has traditionally taken a harder line on China in terms of China's threat to American security. Even though the issue of jobs going overseas, being going to China or going to India is something uh, that has played out for a domestic audience and is something that's very important to Americans. I mean, how is that 
perceived in China. Is that not seen as a criticism of China? Uh, no, I think the Chinese are worried about protectionism. However, as far as protectionism from the U.S. is concerned, China has allies inside the U.S., American companies. They can help blunt the pressures on Chinese trade with the U.S. But if it's China's military threat, then there is simply no limit to the kind of hype you can make regarding China as a threat to American supremacy. So between the two, of course, these are difficult choices. They would rather pick a more protectionist president than a much more alarmist president. Mm -hmm. well, what do you see as the main differences between Senator McCain and Senator Obama when it comes to the main planks of foreign policy issues towards China? McCain thinks China is important, but he does not factor China in as a partner. His League of Democracies will exclude China, and McCain will view Japan rather than China as America's anchor ally in the Asia Pacific. Obama, on the other hand, probably will view China more as a partner rather uh, as uh, more as a partner than a competitor. And you wrote not that long ago um, uh, about. China's political system, you said, is more likely to experience uh, decay and democracy. And, than uh, democracy. Yes, than democracy. Is that that's correct? Yes. And you, you also said that despite China's double-digit growth, its governance policies will actually lead to fragility and instability. I mean, this is something that's likely to happen, what, within the next 10 to 15 to 20 years? I mean, just to flesh that idea out for us a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, well, I think China has been an economic success story. But on the political front, there's a lot of disappointment because despite economic growth, the Chinese political system remains very undemocratic, if not anti-democratic. Uh, civil society is not developed. The government has shown very little interest in establishing a true system of rule of law. Uh, so that's Although there has been some progress. Progress, but, the but then from a very low base. I mean, you compare China to years ago, there's a Stalinistic North Korean type totalitarian state. Today, after 30 years, you should not really apply that kind of standard. You should apply the prevailing global standards, which is far more open politically. Uh, a lot more countries today are democratic. Human rights practices are much better in countries that even have a lower level of economic development. So I think China has a lot to catch up on that front. Okay, Ming Xinpei, thank you very much for coming on the program. Okay. Thank you. On the surface, Human Maj might not seem like someone who knows Iranian politics and culture. After all, he's a former record executive who produced albums for U2 and the Cranberries. However, scratch the surface and his heritage shines through. In his new novel, The Ayatollah Begs to Differ, The Paradox of Modern Iran, Maj explores the complexities present in modern Iranian society, trying to illuminate for his Western audience a country that many know only for its nuclear ambitions. In a moment, we're going to have a conversation with Human Maj, but first, here's a short video about the making of the Ayatollah Begs to Differ. My name is Human Maj, and I've spent most of my life in the U.S., but in the last few years, I've been returning to Iran for extended stays. I travel around the country, but spend most of my time in Tehran, the capital, where almost 20% of the population lives in a sprawling modern city. As a writer, as an Iranian, and as an American, I very much wanted to tell the story of Iran and its people as they are, warts and all, and not as we presume them to be. Here I am in Tehran in February 2007, hitching a ride on the back of a motorcycle to get around the city, which is notorious for its horrendous traffic jams and even worse drivers. I stay in South Tehran, which is the working class part of town, where you are likely to see a whole family packed four to a bike. This is where the more religious minded live, where one is reminded almost daily that Iran is an Islamic country, 
and where conservative politicians such as President Ahmadinejad find great support. Uptown, where I attend parties in private homes and am offered alcohol and marijuana, is where you see fashionable women on the streets testing the limits of the hijab and the modest dress laws. An undercurrent of Islam is evident almost everywhere in Iran. But what we think of as a theocracy is not always accurate. And what is striking for a visitor is how little fear there is among the population. There's no oppressive atmosphere or a sense that a secret police or a moral squad is watching the citizens every move. And most people go about their daily lives concerned more with economics than with the political situation. Women work, move about the city unescorted, and drive every bit as aggressively as their male counterparts, even taxi cabs. Unless one is in the direct vicinity of a mosque, there's no audible call to prayer, and the city doesn't grind to a halt at the designated Muslim prayer times. There are lively political discussions everywhere Iranians gather. There are no bars, but the authorities rarely make any effort to curtail the lively black market in every imaginable alcoholic drink. The holy month of Muharram is when you see Islam, specifically Shia Islam, on its most extreme display. Men beat themselves to show their grief for the death of the martyr Hossein. Women wail and often hit themselves over the head. And even secular Iranians sometimes beat their chests in sympathy, as I do. For Iranians, being Shia means being burdened with a unique inferiority-superiority complex. Inferiority because Shias have always been the minority oppressed by the Sunni majority, and superiority because of a sincere belief that their version of Islam is the right and just one. Iranians' sense of being an oppressed minority gives them an exaggerated sense of what their rights are. Basic rights are, for Shia people, paramount. And this plays out strongly in the nuclear issue. Driving south from Tehran, about an hour away, in a series of buildings clearly visible from the highway, is the center of Iran's nuclear program. The drive to become a nuclear power, supposedly a peaceful one, has the support of Iranians of all political stripes. The nuclear issue feeds the Iranian inferiority-superiority complex in a way most foreign politicians cannot begin to understand. As I drive by these buildings in Natanz, I can't help but think that this is probably the US Air Force's number one bombing target, should the nuclear confrontation between Iran and the US spiral out of control. My hope in writing the Ayatollah begs to differ is that Iranians and Americans might come to understand each other a little bit better, so that it never will. Joining us to talk about the Ayatollah begs to differ is the author, Human Maj. Human, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. I want to start by asking you about the U.S. financial crisis. How is that economic mess impacting on the lives of ordinary Iranians, if indeed it has had any impact? Well, it hasn't really had an impact on the lives of ordinary Iranians. Um, they have their own economic problems right now in Iran and have had for a long time, partly due to the U.S unilateral sanctions and partly due to the UN sanctions on Iran. But it's funny because President Ahmadinejad actually said um, that uh, in response to the financial crisis said that it was due to Western governments moving away from God, again to burnish his credentials as a very pious man. And he said that he thought that uh, the Western governments should get closer to God, which to be fair to him, the Pope also said. Um, but it hasn't really impacted the Iranian people, and it probably won't. There's no real credit in Iran. There never has been for a, a long time, partly because the credit markets are controlled by the United States. So the idea of mortgages, credits, banks failing, all that is alien to Iran. And um, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem as though it's going to affect this specific crisis that we're going through right now is going to affect Iran. There's a very small stock market in Iran that actually hasn't been affected by the credit crunch here or by the... Uh, so when uh, Iranians want to pay, buy a house, they put down, they pay in cash? A lot of times they do. They, a lot of times, that, that, it's a cash society. First of all, credit cards don't exist in Iran, partly, again, because Visa, American Express, MasterCard, all these cards have some base in America, and so they can't do business with Iran. They can't do business with Iranian banks. So there's no credit cards. In terms of mortgages, there are mortgages, yes. People can get loans from banks, but it's not like 10% down or 5% down or no money down. Cars, people can get loans for cars too, but generally, again, people buy cash if they can. The idea is that you know, if you don't have the money, you can't afford it. Right. So that's kind of a very <laughs> traditional 19th century way of looking at things. Right. Well, what else is going on in Iran economically with regards to jobs, with regards to, with regards to oil? Very high unemployment. So with regards to jobs, they have a serious problem, partly because they have a very, very educated young class of people. Um, highly educated university graduates, and there just simply aren't enough jobs. There isn't enough investment in the in the um, in in the infrastructure of Iran. There isn't enough. Um, there isn't. Basically, there just isn't enough um, business 
which is partly our fault for imposing the sanctions that we've imposed on Iran, and foreign investment, and e e Iranian firms don't like to invest. So there's, generally speaking, 